Hi everybody, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Helsinki at Slush. And I have to say I feel really honored and blessed to be here because the vibe is very much entrepreneurial. It's very different from what I know from the conferences I usually go. And I feel just like a little, uh, a little um, groupie being here rediscovering the joy of entrepreneurship. Not that I'm not having fun with my own company, but seeing how it's, uh, it's, uh, it's grooming everywhere is very, uh, very exciting for me. So today I want to talk to you about um, a sad news. Is that uh, Conto has scaled. Uh, it's, it's pretty well known in Europe now. We're doing finance management, finance solution for SMEs in Europe. And somehow we started five years ago in the early days of zero to one, the early days of sitting on a bench, deciding everything as a small group of people that is working mostly through instinct, through expertise, is somehow far gone. Because there is this law of gravity that is happening, happening to all of us, whether we want it or not, which is called big company disease. When the company grows, many countries, many languages, hundreds of thousands of lines of codes, um, a lot of tickets, a lot of clients, entropy becomes a reality. And the human brain reacts in a very weird way. We put in place processes, we start to tell people what to do, so they become kind of like robots, you know? And it, we don't do it on purpose, we just do it because that's how, what, what we're used to, because that's the way we've been managed to as a former contributor in a company we didn't found. And because we're in the builder scene, uh, it's an important one, I wanted to share with you my take on how we've been shaping the Kanto culture to avoid falling in this weird law of gravity we will eventually all fall into. But before getting there, just a few words about Conto. The market of Conto is 25 million SMEs. It's a huge market, and SMEs is the heartbeat. It's literally the heartbeat of the economy and the sociality of, the, of Europe. It's literally like 50% of GDP, two-thirds of jobs, there are in some countries more SMEs than actual births in a country created every year. So it's a serious thing. And eventually, those SMEs are served by financial, uh, financial services that are not at the stake of where they should be. The net promoter scores, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is negative. So Hollywood call it a passionate crime. You have more haters than promoters in this industry. And so in 2017, with my business co-founder, Alexandre, we built the first company together. So we lived and we know too well what it is to go through the finance admin burden and bureaucracy. And so we said, okay, let's fix it as a second company together around the recipe for success, which is fairly simple if you look around it's what you could see at Amazon, at many companies that we, we, we use the service of. A leaner product, which means when you connect to the app, you can do pretty much everything you'd like. Uh, increasing the limits of your, of your cards, wiring money unlimited without having to, to upload hundreds of documents to get it approved, uh, and so forth and so on, to bookkeeping and anything. A faster support, because when you're an entrepreneur, well, you do the admin, when your partners are sleeping, the one you want, to deal, you want to make deals with. Which means after 5 p.m., which is when banks traditionally close, okay? And on weekends, when you're quiet and you just want to kind of get the shit done uh, in a quiet moment. And the third piece is a fair pricing. Because it's a nightmare, as we all know. I see some of the faces doing yes. Yeah, we're all in the same boat. And so we said, let's do that. It was common sense, very intuitive, and it could make a business considering the NPS that I showed before, but also the size of the market, which is tremendous. And so this is Conto. So we did it. Okay, we launched Conto. This is the current website. And we provide a product that does business account, cards, invoice management, spend management, bookkeeping, reporting. Think about Google Workspace for finance for SMEs. And we reached the slam dunk. So we got the NPS at 75. Actually 76, but it's 75 plus. It's pretty high. So that's the number from last month. 
We got 300,000 business clients in France, Germany, Italy, Spain. We just acquired a German company. The honeymoon is perfect. It's coming, it's coming, I swear. <laughs> we got the, the um, how we call that? Um, glory, gl glorifying metric, you know, the ego metric. We got the half decay corn metric. $5 billion valued in 2022 for our fifth anniversary. So we're on fire, think about us as founders. Yeah, we made it, we think we made it. The team, we've grown the team. We've provided a lot of jobs, which is also the company's responsibility. Actually, it's the company's responsibility in the first place, if you think about the second industrial revolution. That's why companies became important, because they were providing jobs, which provided food and home and so on. So this is what we do. But then the inconvenient truth happened. The same people, including myself, who made it to these great metrics are waking up. And those are real screenshots, recent ones, of customers, both external, so paying customers, and internal customers, so anonymous engagement survey verbatims. Okay? As a customer-obsessed company, we have become what we ran away from in the first place. We shut down accounts we shouldn't have. We asked for uh, dozens of documents to get a, a, a transfer done by this German company on the top right that is actually blaming us for asking so many documents. So the processes haven't scaled. But the team is awesome. We have access to an awesome team, OK? We have a pool of talent that is amazing. Keep that in mind. And everything is going OK. And so we are literally that close to become what we run away from in the first place. OK, I'm being dramatic, but it's true. It's happening to everybody. We hear a lot of companies actually doing Series A, Series B, Series C. Do you hear a lot, do you hear a lot of D, E, F or, growing or being profitable? There are not so many. There is a reason why, because the business product market fit has been proven. What is the friction? the law of gravity that is blocking the company to honor his destiny correctly in an agile way, like it was day one, okay? And the weird thing is that when it's becoming messy, when it's a bit chaos, we as humans, and I'm including myself, I'm talking about me right now, you believe me or not, but we react using the patterns we know in the, 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 the mental photo we have on how a company should be designed and how management should happen. And we all do a command and control because when the metric starts not to be good, when customers start to complain, well, we could do it ourselves when we have very small user base. So we start to do to-do lists to our people and we use our resources to execute. Okay? And it sounds dramatic again, but I do it, and you do it without knowing it. And so what do we do after we do that? We get feedback from our team, which says, yeah, but I'm not autonomous. I'm not this. And this is absolutely true. So what do we do? We go to the other extreme. And we say, OK, now we're a freedom form company. Now, you know, do whatever you want. Do it the way you want. And, um, but it's chaos. It doesn't work. Even when you play soccer or basketball, you need a field, you need a framework. Okay, so teamwork can happen. So people are aligned on the same things and so on. I'm sure you know this guy. I, I know I love The Office, Michael Scott. So he's the common and control guy who's pretending to be a cool guy. Okay, he's pretending to be freedom form company, but is actually controlling the guys. Okay, so that's another extreme. Those are saying they're cool guys, but they're actually doing all the way around. And now we have a Neo Morpheus. Sorry, I'm 40, so I'm a Matrix generation. Okay, this, this was a thing back in the days. And so we have a blue pill, red pill uh, decision to make. Do we take the blue pill? And the blue pill is, okay, we just do the way we know intuitively, which is command and control. 
okay? And we keep going, and if we have bad customers, we just talk to the guy, replace them. Basically, bad managers, okay? Or do we take the red pill and say, but what if we, we get it all wrong when it comes to scaling a company, you know? What if there is something very smart people don't see, that we would call misconceptions, that they think is great, but prevents them to be actually awesome, including myself. And what if, if we look very closely to the state of the art, to the people who thought about it, there are not so many. They're the big usual suspect. So I won't talk about Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, and others, and Elon Musk, I swear. But I want to talk to you about someone who is off the grid and has been instrumental in thinking differently on how to scale a company. His name is Ed Catmull. He's one of the founders at Pixar. Okay, he got inspired very much by um, a company culture uh, from Japan in the 60s. This company is Toyota. So what, are, what is a car manufacturing, manufacturing player doing with Pixar, which is basically movies we'll go every year to see with our kids? Well, if you look closely at the result, because that's what matters in the end, shareholder value, customer value, team value. Let's look at it. One movie a year, 600 million euro per movie, and the highest employee NPS, the lowest turnover of the industry. Okay? So why him and not others? And if you read about him, you can Google it. Don't, not now, wait, wait when I'm done. But right after, you can Google it. The guy says, I'm obsessed with the hidden thing, so the thing I don't see, okay, that may bring the company down. So instead of focusing on the to-do list, hey, do this movie, this, do this animation, do this, and so on, he's focusing on making visual what are the, the blockers team members will encounter if they're working autonomously? Because those hidden things are actually the blocking stuff for the performance of the company. And so he makes problems visible, visible. So problems are actually printed on the walls. OK? It's not like uh, on a Slack channel, which could make sense too. And so the hidden things is what we call at Conto misconceptions, or wrong ideas. And if you think about it, we all encounter problems when we scale. A process doesn't work anymore, uh, we have issues on the org, we launch a new feature, it doesn't meet the success. Essentially, a problem is a gap of performance. We expected something, but the reality is different, and there is this gap, okay? But eventually, this problem is a consequence of actual people, again, including myself, thinking we do it right. So another way to look at it is that a gap of problem is a gap of know-how, okay? If a meeting is not good, maybe my know-how, my conception, my mental conception on what is a good meeting is wrong, okay? But when I do it, I'm pretty convinced, you know? I know I'm gonna be awesome. And actually, I'm not. So those are the blind spots. Those are the misconceptions. Sorry, it's early morning. I hope you had coffee. It's a bit asking a juice of brain here. But for real, this is very important for the, for the next slides. Because the whole company culture is built on that. The Kanto way, this is how we call our culture, is one thing. Everything we do serves one purpose is to foster a deliberate practice of problem solving, but not just problem solving, oh, I have a customer problem, I'm going to solve it. We use, I'm sure you know or you heard, or some of you heard, the five whys. And the fifth why is, what am I missing? What am I doing not the right way? OK? We usually blame the machine or other teams. At Conto, it's not about blaming. It's about telling you, your own misconceptions that are probably different than from others is your problem. Take care of it. We're going to help you, and nobody is going to blame at you. Because for us, big company disease is when people stop learning. They stop moving. 
And so you get it, we took the red pill. And honestly, there is nothing harder on earth, at least for me again, to look at yourself in the mirror and see what you're doing wrong when you actually thought you would do it right. Think about the earth is flat. A few people got their heads chopped for saying that or believing that until everybody accepted it's round. Not everybody, we still have a few, they, they think it's flat, but for most of us. And so I'm gonna show you a few examples, a few examples. The first misconception I had myself is that people need to be told if they're doing a great job. I'm not saying we shouldn't congratulate each other for big achievements. Of course we need. Like when you're a company, you put a lot of passion, a lot of commitment, you sweat, you have hard moments, better moments. It's important to celebrate, of course. But a more interesting way to think about how people um, know if they are doing a good job or not, it's to invest on building a really good tool that tells them where, whether their own video game is going well or not. When you play video game like I do, you don't want someone to tell you, oh, tell me if I'm succeeding at uh, winning the race. You don't want that, you want to know by yourself because autonomy is a key pillar of motivation. You want to you live your life you know, as, a, as a contributor. And so this is exactly what we do. We create visual, so each person at Conto know whether they're succeeding. And succeeding is about quality, being on time, lowering the cost, you name it. But we always go back to these common denominators. And so we invest a lot in building those visual management. And actually, we all do it. I'm not from Notion, but we all do it with Notion. So Notion is pretty, a pretty good starting point for that. The second is that, um, I don't know if you read Nine Lies About Work. It's a great book, and they talk about feedback. And my, 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 my take, based on experience again, um, is that people don't need feedback to progress. I'm not saying, again, feedback is bad. It's actually good to talk, what's going on, and so on. It's good to have a dialogue, ongoing dialogue. But the hard pieces, the feedback on the misconception, how can you give a feedback to someone who doesn't see what is limiting himself or herself to do a better job? How do you want to do that? How do you do that? You don't. So what, 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 another way to think about it, and again, I'm not saying feedback is a bad thing, but a, a very, let's say, built-in way to do it on the job is to actually encourage your team to do problem solving the right way, which is going back to what do I miss? And here I put you an example from the team. It's a real example, recent one, I think. Yeah, it's August, so it's, it's September example. And so the team, it's product marketing, realizing and data, realizing the way they work is completely um, fucked up. <laughs> and that their own problem, the manager doesn't need to know. It's that their own life in the end. Another controversial one is that data creates value. Um, we're a big fan of data at Conto. We spend a lot of money actually getting the data right. Uh, so we are data informed. But as you do command and control, you, without noticing it, you, you, you create some kind of mechanization on how data is used. And so you encounter a situation in which people do A-B testing like they, they're on drugs. You know, they need their fix of A-B testing all the time. And the risk with that is that uh, data replaces expertise. And that's another issue, because when you pay people very ex expensively and very high, and you ask them to just execute and use data without using their own know-how, well, if you're lucky, they, they stay, and they shut your mouth, th their mouth, but well, you kind of underuse their talent, and the worse they leave. And that's a big, big issue again. So another way to look at it is, and here you have an example that has been done, purely da data-driven. So we wanted to have the, the cards to, to offer to our clients the ability to get the, the pin of their card, okay, to retrieve it from the app. We use the data, 
we wanted to decrease the number of tickets. Uh, we implemented the feature. We did not change the number of tickets. <laughs> and I asked the product manager, but why? Close your eyes and tell me what is missing. Oh, I know what is missing. I could do it in five minutes. You see? And so this kind of people become robots very quickly with command and control. And it's very dangerous because it slows down the company. It creates a lot of waste, a lot of free work that is unnecessary. And who is paying the price? The clients, of course. And who is the second person who is paying the, cli the, the, the price? The person himself or herself. Because it's frustrating to rework the same thing over and over and over. The last example I want to give you is about procedures. So when you scale, what do you do? Well, you write procedures. <laughs> so people follow them. But do they follow them? Well, if you're lucky, they do. But if you're not lucky, they do. But the company is scaling so fast that the procedure doesn't make sense anymore. So it's not working. And this is the exact example here. So what we want is not having people following, being compliant. We don't want Dark Vader. We want Jedis. We don't want people to comply. We want people that can adapt. And so again, another way to look at procedures is forget about the procedures and focus on the person, on the know-how. Not even the knowledge, but the know-how. How do you do? So my take here um, is that maybe there is a third way to look at management and how to scale, how to prevent us to go in the trap of the big company disease. Uh, for me, at least, is that people don't need to, do, to be told how and what they should be do doing, honestly. But like a curling player, maybe it's popular in Finland, I don't know. You know curling, like this weird, this, this, for, for a French guy, it's a very weird sport. You throw a stone, and the, the, the actual skill is to clean in front of the stone. And maybe that is the role of a company leader, removing the obstacles. And we call that orient and support. You give a direction, and you support. You, remove, you help people, or you create the conditions. So people can face their own misconception and be autonomous in their own hero journey somehow. And the Kanto way is just about this. It starts with our manifesto. So it's that long. Our manifesto is fairly short. First paragraph is incumbents are energy vampires. We want to fix that. Second paragraph is, oh, we actually want to fix that. Here is our mission. Third paragraph is how do we get there? And we say it. We want it to be the finance solutions that energize SME. We need to fix ourselves first. I love this book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And in the book, you have this discussion. And one guy asks, but how do you do great paintings? And the guy answers, well, I become a great painter, and then I paint. How can we serve SMEs properly if we don't fix the way we think about scaling a company? It continues with our values. They talk to our users. You see the definition in small. That's for our users. For us, ambition, the hardest, is to face misconceptions. Mastery is about when you have a to-do list, you don't look at them as tasks, but as new opportunity to learn. Teamwork. Teamwork is not a weird concept. It's the ability of a team to deliver quality to each other, internal clients, on time. And the three cannot be possible with the force. No blame policy. Because if you start talking about your own misconception and your boss tell you, I don't want to know, just show me the result. That's a big issue. We even have a system to operationalize those values. I won't get into details, but as uh, our friend Daniel Cole would say, he wrote a great book about, um, it's called The Culture Code. It's a great book. And basically, I can sum it up for you if you haven't read it. Our cultures equal our actions. This is what it says. And so values don't make any sense if they are not lived and operationalized every day. If there is not one thing that pinch you, so you remember about them. 
we invest a lot, not in telling people what they should be doing, but in training them on how to look at misconception. Basically, it's a training, self-training, it's not mandatory, and we pass them new, new, new pair of glasses so they can, they can start looking at their own job in a slightly different way. It's very intense, I'm sorry. It's very quiet, <laughs> but we're almost there. Um, my big take here is that we're in a culture where we think implementing is the end game, but my take on uh, the last five, six years at Conto and the last 10 years as an entrepreneur, it's still young, is that implementing is never going to lead you to resting, okay? It's something you nourish permanently and you, you need to have the passion to build a great company and it never stops, ever. Because the day you stop, well, you become that. And that's what you run away from in the first place. So that's very likely why you left the company you've been working at before you decided to build your own. So join me if you want to think about a third way to grow a company to scale. Log to contoway.com and react to the article we passed and reach out. I'd love to talk about that with you. And thank you for your time and hosting me. Thank you.